Hey guys, this is Craig Migliaccio from AEC Service Tech, and today what we're going over is an outdoor heat pump, and we're going to be going over the electrical components as well as the refrigerant components. Now, this is an American Standard Train outdoor heat pump. We're going to be going over some of the refrigerant circuit components first, and then we'll get into the electrical components. And one of the most obvious things in a heat pump is the reversing valve. And so this is used to switch the directional flow of the refrigerant and so you see that the refrigerant goes this way and then you have your, your high pressure discharge gas coming over to this tube. When you switch it this way, your high pressure discharge gas comes over to this tube and these two tubes are connected. So this is always your true suction. This is always your high pressure discharge. You can see that there's a tap here for your high pressure discharge and then there's a true suction tap right here. That's a port that you can access after taking this grill off. In this case, on this heat pump, there is not a third port over here. It's actually located there. On the back of the reversing valve, there's a little electrical solenoid, and that is what's powered in order to change the directional flow of the refrigerant via these two little tubes here. Now let's go to the service valves. Over here, you have a standard two position service valve, and you can see that you can just move it with a regular ratcheting service wrench. And the whole point of this service valve is that it can shut off between this tube right here and this tube. And so you can see the, the lower tube and the higher tube. When this is front seated all the way, these two are connected. And when it's, uh, it's not back seated, you can't back seat this, but when you back the valve up, then all three are connected. So it has a little Schrader valve in the end. And just so you know, this liquid line is still liquid line, regardless of whether it's in air conditioning mode or in heating mode. It's just the direction of the subcooled liquid traveling in it. Now, heating mode, the subcooled liquid is traveling this way. And in air conditioning mode, it's traveling this way. Now here you have a ball valve. And so that's, that's different on this particular one. And so you can see this is a bigger version. You just can shut it off just like that, just with an adjustable wrench. And this one always has vapor in it. And so you have your hot discharge gas traveling this way, so towards the indoor coil during heating mode, and then you have low pressure vapor traveling this way during air conditioning mode. So that's why I wanted to cover both of these. These two right here have valve cores in them once you remove the port caps. Now, if you were to add refrigerant into this system while you're in air conditioning mode, you can add it at this port right here or at this port because this is the true suction port. And if you're in heating mode, these are both going to be high pressure. Remember that this is your discharge line and then this is, has subcooled liquid refrigerant in it. So this port right here is going to be the only one that's low pressure and that's where you would add your refrigerant at. The next component that we're going to go over is the filter dryer. And in this case, you see that there is no rust on it. Over here, you do see rust. It's, it's steel and it's a bi-flow filter dryer. So it's also installed always on the liquid line. You rarely have a suction line filter dryer. That's only if you have a compressor burnout or something like that. And you'd want to remove this later so that you don't block that oil return to the compressor. But this filter dryer's job is to be able to absorb any moisture that's traveling through the line. And it's also able to block any debris traveling through the line. However, this is a bi-flow, so it can go in both directions. So it's always installed between this metering device at the outdoor unit and the indoor metering device. The next component that I want to cover is this thermostatic expansion valve. So in this case, this TXV is only active in heating mode. And so the refrigerant is going to be subcooled liquid heading in, and then it's going to be low pressure liquid heading out to this outdoor coil. Now this coil during heating mode is going to be the evaporator. And during air conditioning mode, this is going to be the condenser coil. So you, gotta, you can't just call this coil a condenser or an evaporator because it changes depending on if you're in heating mode or air conditioning mode. But what's going to happen is this is going to be active in heating mode and then it's going to be inactive in air conditioning mode. When the refrigerant's traveling this way, there's a check valve right in here. It's going to allow it to go right through without a pressure drop and it's going to go this way towards the indoor unit. So with this TXV during heating mode when it is active it's able to maintain the superheat so it's able to maintain the amount of refrigerant heading into this outdoor coil and it does that by three pressures and one is the bulb pressure coming off of the head of the TXV and that is actually located right down here on the suction line on the true suction line it's always the low pressure line you also have an external equalization line right here right near where your bulb was mounted at and that is right here on the the TXV and then you have a spring on the bottom. So the spring right in here is the closing force for the inside of the TXV. The external equalization line is also a closing force and the bulb is an opening force pressing downwards. 
So based on those three pressures, it's able to maintain the superheat across this, this coil right here during heating mode. Now in the case of a TXV, you typically don't have an accumulator like this. So a lot of times you'll see this right next to your compressor on the inside. Uh, this is typically matched with a piston or a fixed orifice metering device that's only active during heating mode. Uh, but this is there as a uh, area to store refrigerant and to protect the, the compressor from liquid refrigerant entering it. So it can only allow vapor refrigerant entering it. So if you want to learn more about the accumulator, check out the video in the description section below. But in this case, our TXV is able to handle the superheat and main, if it can handle the superheat, then it knows that it's only allowing vapor refrigerant to the vapor compressor. So it's able to protect it, but only to a certain extent. The next component we're going to discuss is the compressor, and that is a pressure increasing device. So you have low pressure vapor coming in and high pressure vapor coming out. And then if you look right here on the inlet of the compressor, you see a low pressure switch. Now that's normally closed. And so you're not going to have power to the contactor over here unless that switch is closed due to a high enough pressure that would typically only go off if you were very low on refrigerant. Now you see this thermal limit switch. Now that right there is on the discharge line. And in this case, on this particular unit, that is only for the crankcase heater. And if you look on the side, it says L105 minus 32. And what that means is the switch is gonna close anytime the temperature is below 73 degrees and it's going to open back up again anytime the temperature is above 105. Now that's there just to allow this crankcase heater right here to power and to heat up the bottom of the compressor to warm the oil. Now just be aware that some units have two pressure switches, a high and a low pressure switch. Some may have a thermal limit for a high discharge temperature, you know, and most of them have a low pressure switch. Now we're gonna move on to the electrical components and over here, right up top, we have the outdoor unit fan. The outdoor unit fan pulls air in from here and pushes it out the top. And so in heating mode, the air, what's happening is you're pulling heat across the coil and the refrigerant's job is to absorb that heat. And then during air conditioning mode, what's happening is you're pulling low temperature air across the high temperature fins because you have high temperature refrigerant uh, flowing through that. And what's happening is you have high temperature air exiting. So the refrigerant is rejecting the heat into the air. Right here, we have a fan relay switch and that's mounted on the defrost control board. So during defrost mode, which is when any time that you have low temperature fins, meaning like maybe you have frost and ice gathered on them, what's going to happen is you have your, your ambient temp sensor, which is mounted right here, and your, your coil temp sensor that's mounted right here, and that's down here. Any time that, that the resistance value on those triggers defrost to occur, this, this little relay switch right here is going to open up the normally closed electrical connection. It's going to shut off the fan up top. You're also going to have power going to the reversing valve because you were in heating mode. Now you're powering the reversing valve, putting it into cooling mode. And then you're going to have 24 volts going to your, your indoor air handler to power the electric strip heaters in order to offset this unit being basically in air conditioning mode, uh, just in order to melt the frost and the ice off. In reference to the defrost board, we have our ambient temp sensor and also our coil sensor right here and I'll tell you that they they operate the same way as a standard temp sensor would be like just like this one right here a k-type temp sensor anytime that you uh, put your hand on this and warm up the temp sensor your resistance is going to uh, decrease so your electrical resistance on this is going to decrease so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take this and I'm going to put my multimeter probes on the back. So here we have our coil temperature sensor and our multimeter. We're measuring the electrical resistance and we measure 12.34 ohms. If we wrap our hand around this, you'll see the electrical resistance lowers rapidly. And so what this is doing is this defrost board is actually looking for a change in temperature between this temp sensor down here, which is your ambient temp sensor and your coil temp sensor. It's looking for a delta T of, of temperature. So that's what's gonna initiate defrost and then it's going to terminate uh, once this coil temperature sensor gets up to say 47 degrees uh, or you can cut this jumper, it might be 70 degrees. That's when it's gonna terminate. 
So this, this board right here is able to control the reversing valve, the fan, and also the output to the air handler for defrost to occur. Now let's just get to the simpler stuff right here, which is the thermostat wiring. You have your blue is typically common, your yellow, this is typically your compressor, your black in this case, it is your, your output from this defrost board for your electric strip heating. You also have your, your red, which is your 24 volt power all the time, and then you have your orange, and that is your reversing valve. So that's your thermostat wires right here. And then you have your main power wires coming in, which are your, each one of these is 120 volts. So together they're 240 volts, and this is a single phase unit. Here's your ground wire. Here we have a run capacitor, and this is a dual run capacitor because it has three uh, sets of tabs on the top from the common, which it has the four tabs, to the fan. So that's, that's the capacitor for the outdoor unit fan. And then you have from common to herm, and that is for the compressor. And so the capacitor's job, what it does is it stores and releases electrical energy, and it also creates an artificial phase for a permanent split capacitor motor to turn on. So this artificial phase is what initiates the turn for the motor to start, but it's also needed in order to continue to allow that uh, motor to run. So this run capacitor is going to be connected with that outdoor fan and with that compressor the entire time while it's running. Now this is different. This is a start capacitor and this is only going to be connected to the uh, start winding for the first say quarter second or so. And it's there to provide extra electrical power for that compressor starting. And this component right here is referred to as a 521 relay or a potential relay and its job is to kick the start capacitor out of the electrical circuit after the first quarter uh, second of runtime of the compressor running. And so the compressor, anytime the motor is spinning, it creates a back EMF. So it's a back voltage that's created by the motor spinning. Once that motor gets up to speed, it's gonna power this coil and it's gonna open up the electrical contacts that are connected to the start capacitor. So this is no longer gonna be connected after the first quarter second of runtime for the compressor. Now the, the run cap, that's not gonna be affected by this at all. And the other thing right here that you see, that's called a contactor. And that's a single pole contactor because this is the only one that's moving. This is always connected on this side. And so this contactor is also referred to as a single pole, single throw. And that's because it's normally in the open position. It only has one action, which means it will close anytime that you have power to the side of the contactor. In this case, it's a 24 volt contactor. So you apply power to the side to the coil, it sucks it downwards and it closes the normally open set of contacts. And so what you have is this is one of your power legs that's, that's normally closed with the rest of the electrical circuit. And so you're only breaking this one 120 volt leg, but once you close it, you're gonna apply power, your 240 volts to your fan motor and also to your compressor. Anytime you see these jumbles of wires like this, don't get overwhelmed. You just, it's just a matter of your component identification and then also reading the wiring diagram for your unit. But in this case right here, this yellow wire is connected to the low pressure switch. And then we also have our purple wire here that was to power a crankcase heater. And, and that's that uh, thermal limit switch that shuts off our crankcase heater or allows it to turn on. You know, we have our wires right here coming off of our terminals. And so um, right here, half of these are our thermostat wires. So that's, that's pretty simple right there. So the whole point is don't get overwhelmed. Just be aware of what each of the components are and what they do. And if you wanna learn more about any of these components, the contactor, the potential relay, the capacitor, check out more videos down in the description section below. I hope you enjoyed this tour through this American Standard Train Heat Pump Unit. And so if you want to learn more about HVAC, make sure you check out our website at aecsurfacetech.com where we have articles, we've got quick tips, calculators, quizzes, the podcast, and we also have our refrigerant charting and service procedures for air conditioning book. We've got the full outline there so you can check out what it's all about. We've got a thousand question workbook and quick reference cards. And we also have these products over on Amazon as well. Hope you enjoyed yourself. We'll see you next time at AC Service Tech Channel.